Hello and welcome to the second event of this Orient series on war economies in North Africa and West Asia. Today's event will focus on war economy in Kurdistan, Iraq and Central Iraq. My name is Ansar Jasen and I'm going to moder moderate this event and I represent this Orient. This Orient is a collective of progressive journalists, academics and activists working between Germany, West Asia and North Africa. Inspired by post-colonial and feminist thoughts, we run an online magazine and if we are not under lockdown, right, like right now, we organize public events and do political education in Germany. For more information about our project and our activities, you can visit our Facebook page, um, as you're probably doing right now, or our website, um, thisorient.de. And if you like this event and you have similar ideas like this in mind, uh, we would uh, like to encourage you to contact us and uh, even to consider to become a supportive member or to donate to us. This event is uh, realized in cooperation with the Bildungswerk of the Heinrich Böll Foundation and is supported by the Deutsche Klassenbatterie. After having had the last event actually live uh, and in February, we had planned this event for March and we're actually really happy that we finally found a solution to make this event um, to re realize this event virtually and actually to include you. Um, so please feel free to engage. You can write to us on Facebook in the Facebook chat or you can write to us under the following email Eva, e -V -A dot Garke, G -A -R -C -K -E, at disorient.de. Today, we will be dealing with a critical perspective on the two concepts, the economy and war economy, with a particular look on Kurdistan, Iraq and Central Iraq. In this regard, we are very much looking forward to listen to the analysis and discussing with tonight's uh, discussant, uh, Shedu Basama, who is sitting right next to me. Further, we will show videos from the two activists, Sami Adnan and Zia Tariq, from the Baghdad-based collective Workers Against Sectarianism. Um, and they will discuss, amongst other things, the self-organization of the recent Iraqi protest movement. But due to the really bad infrastructure in Iraq and missing electricity provision even 17 years after the American invasion of Iraq, they cannot join us here live today as the internet cannot sustain the connection. Also, this is actually a very practical example of the political economy of post-2003 Iraq. Before delving into Sheguva's remarks on the economy and Iraq, we would like to quickly recapture the discussion from the very first event we had with Jamie Allenson and Raja Makawi. First of all, we actually thought it's uh, too, um, really important to reopen the discussion on war economies from a critical leftist and Marxist point of view. At the latest, with the reconstruction debate on Syria, the question of war economy and post-war economy, which is often formulated as the prerequisite to build sustainable peace, appeared to us that this is a actually a really important uh, question to discuss, but from a really critical um, angle. Jamie challenged through a Marxist understanding of economy the very prevalent assumption that war and economy are two opposite things. Ledetta assumes that the distortion of the economy by war is what explains the outbreak of civil war. Of the many important points Jamie made during the talk, we want to take with us into tonight's discussion that the war economy model ignores the fact that the conditions of the pre-war economy the so-called peace economy is the so-called peace economy is the very reason why either a war starts or why people start revolutions and start to fight actually against continuous dispossession and against continuous um, repression, as in the case of Syria or as in the case um, of other countries like Sudan, Iraq, and so on. And we will discuss this uh, in further depth also today. Also, the other discussant uh, in February, Raja Makawi, uh, who is an editor of African Arguments, and I will all uh, encourage you to actually visit their homepage to follow the really important discussions there. She also followed up on the idea of um, 
Jamie's uh, presumption by showing that the peace agreements for Sudan were always only uh, compromises of and for the elite, but have never touched upon the underlying social economic conflicts. Today, Sheluva will lay down yet another perspective on how to understand economy and elaborate on this thought, focusing on specific aspects of Iraqi history and Kurdistan Iraqi history from this very uh, critical lens. In this sense, we understand the series as a continuous learning process and also a continuous discussion with you. So again, I want to encourage you to please write your questions, your comments in the chat or to write um, to the email that I will repeat, eva.gabke at disorient.de. Uh, so let us now start with today's focus on Kurdistan Iraq and Central Iraq. And in order to bring all these different topics we want to discuss today together, it's actually a really good idea to again have a look at the picture of today's um, events announcement, as it basically sums all the different topics up. So the picture you're seeing uh, right now is from November last year. It's from Baghdad. It's from one of the bridges that uh, were occupied by the protesters. And at the time this picture was taken, the protest movement, uh, the so-called October Revolution, as I'm also going to refer to during this event, was um, already two months old. The picture gives us a very good understanding of how the protesters themselves actually understand the political economy of Iraq. The picture states basically that Iraq's economy is based on oil, which connects Iraq to the global market and also to exploitation, facilitated through Iraq's national elites. The protesters show quite clearly, as you can see on the picture, their refusal of this reality. Iraqi people are not benefiting from this oil-based base economy, rather facing further pauperization, which led to yearly mass protests culminating in the October Revolution of 2019. However, to better understand this entanglement of capitalism in Iraq and its historical roots, the effects on its people and how this connected to the recent protest movement, we will have wonderful inputs today from our guests. So there is Sheluva Sama. She is a PhD student at the University of Exeter, writing her doctoral dissertation on the pop political economy of rural Kurdistan, Iraq. Welcome, uh, Shluva. Then we also have the collective Workers Against Sectarianism, founded in 2019, and it was founded through activists that also, before the revolution, were already involved into different groups uh, on the ground, trying to make a change happen in, in Iraq. And this group today will be represented by Zia Tariq and Sami Adnan, who will join us through their video inputs. We will first listen to Sheluva's remarks proposing her theoretical approach to economy and further explanations through examples. Her input is split into three videos, followed by um, an introduction and further input of three uh, videos of Workers Against Sectarianism. All of these videos you can find in our platform and you can watch and share them individually later. Again, I want to encourage you to share your thoughts and questions with us. During the um, talk, so while showing the videos, I would uh, try to only uh, propose questions of understanding to Schluwe and immediately after we have seen all the videos, have heard all the input, we will open the floor for questions of discussion. So I'm now happy to see the first video. Hi, so um, in this input, I would like to think about the war economy in the context of Iraq and Kurdistan. And I would look at the definitional boundary between war and economy and argue that this boundary is a lot of times fluid boundary um, and is not, does not have a lot of resonance with uh, social reality. So the main question here is, how does war become part of everyday life? 
Um, and I first uh, would like to look at the concepts of economy we have. So usually economy, whether according to today's liberal ideology or within neoliberal um, research approaches, is defined as a mode of production, exchange and consumption geared towards capitalist market. So this means that capital accumulation and profitability are the important and shared goals of human interaction when it comes to having a successful economy. Um, in the preceding Disorient event, we had uh, Jamie Allison who looked at economy from a Marxist perspective in the context of Syria. He stated that war is a form of economy that manages resources and uh, the production and reproduction of life to benefit certain classes of people at the expense of others. Um, if we look at it from a historical anthropology, anthropology perspective, then we have Timothy Mitchell, who states that the idea of a gross national product in a national economy, in which every value shall be measured and quantified, does not reflect empirical reality. For Mitchell, the economy, as we know it, is a discourse by economists and has more to do with their imagination, so with the imagination of the economists, than with the way that value are actually, values are actually created. So he says that the economy discourse then functions only to, and I quote, maintain the difference between monetary and non-monetary, the economic and the personal, the public and the private, unquote. So of course in this discourse, um, the state is left out and traditionally the household, since the household economy uh, is counted as part of the personal sphere that is not producing any monetary values. So profit making basically does not um, does not take place here. Um, of course, these uh, lines are blurry as um, capitalist commoditized values might also run through the household. So in the economy, as it usually is presented to us, is a capitalist economy. And in this representation of economy, what is counted are only monetary values, regardless of the human relations and other values that went into the production of those monetary values. So basically this kind of representation of economy does not depict social reality. It rather serves a capitalist profit making. How else can we then think about the economy? How can we represent economy in a non-capitalist way, but still capture the capitalist profit making economy? This would need a people centered approach to economy. So, um, I would uh, like to give a wider defini definition of economy by Narotsky and Besnier, um, who rethink the economy and say that, I quote, making a living is about making people in their physical, social, spiritual, affective and intellectual dimensions. It is about the forms of human interaction that make different kinds of resources available although often unequally through social relations of production, distribution and consumption. It is about struggles and stabilization around the worth of people and how to make life worth living." Unquote. So lastly, um, I want to say that this definition allows us to search and find the economy in people's everyday life, um, rather than an abstract idea in serving capitalist needs. So if we look at economy in uh, everyday life, we also find how war becomes a means to make a living in everyday life. War becomes a human interaction that makes resources available and uh, at times is used as a motivation to restore people's worth. So the capitalist type of economy is itself violence and consequently war. In certain situations, the capitalist economy turns into war with weapons and brute physical violence. Um, in the next um, video I want to look at this kind of transformation and, um, and look at how the international sanctions against Iraq uh, transformed and turned into a civil war between different faction, Iraqi Kurdish factions. Thanks.
So this was the first uh, video. It was rather a theoretical approach. It really will help us to understand how Shiluva will now elaborate on the historical uh, analysis um, with actually understanding certain events through this understanding of economy. And it also helps us actually to look at people more through the lens of dignity. And I think what is really important is to understand that economy is in people's everyday life. And it not only will help us to understand Iraq's history, but it will also then help us to basically understand aspects of people's realities in Kurdistan, Iraq, but also in today's um, central Iraq. And this is a really important um, addition that for my feeling is often missing in the discussion. And um, I would now um, like to show the second uh, video and uh, please enjoy. Okay, so uh, now I want to look at the international economic sanctions against Iraq and how these turned into the Iraqi-Kurdish civil war. So from 1994 to 1997, a war broke out in Kurdistan, which was a bloody war um, and cost uh, around 5,000 people their lives. There's not much information on it and it remains understudied and silenced in Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan itself. And maybe that might be because it does not fit any narratives. Their dominant understanding of Iraq is usually the Orientalist narrative where people are divided around, uh, along sectarian lines of Sunni, Shia and Kurds. This war, um, Kurds were fighting each other. How does this fit into uh, this narrative then? It doesn't. Um, many analysts lie, uh, tie this kind of war to the tribal mentality of the Kurds and their political parties, a supposedly backward culture. Most of these explanations are very dangerous. They do not take into account the economy and reduce war to culture. The scholar Lietzenberg uh, is one of the scholars who actually takes into account economy. He argues that the war um, broke out because of control and access to resources, goods and food. The war is usually described as a war between the two parties, PUK and KDP. Um, these are two Kurdish nationalist parties. Uh, war ideologies at that time became part of everyday life that structured uh, life along yellow zones for the KDP and green zones for the PUK. Even clothing or colors on the street could indicate who one stands for. Um, however, I would say that it is not only a war between these two parties. There are other Kurdish parties, such as the PKK involved, also Turkey, that invaded Iraq, Saddam's Ba'athist Iraq, who invaded Erbil, as well as the UN. Um, under The UN under US leadership, who had air power in Kurdistan. So to understand this war, I suggest now to look at the textures of the sanctions economy that had been created in people's everyday lives. How did this affect people's lives and how did this lead to war? So there's little ethnographic material to actually support this, um, but uh, I found some from Lissy Schmidt, a journalist who was in Iraqi Kurdistan during the sanctions in the 90s. And she interviews Hushyar, um, who is a resident in Duhok in 1991 and works for, as a translator for the US NGO CARE International. I quote, this organization had been looking for clan leaders amongst the refugees and coordinated the distribution only with them. The clan leaders then distributed the goods as they thought best to people loyal to them. Those who did not uh, want to acknowledge their power were simply left out. Now CARE is trying to establish the structure as well in Zahu. We know that part of the food aid is also sold by clans. What concerns us more is that this pattern of distribution of goods is used to install a political system." Unquote. Hushyar's concerns about, uh, are concerns about his community's position in the global capitalist economy. Usually, what Hushyar describes is seen as a tribal conservative values, 
where a clan leader holds all power. If we acknowledge his perspective, it is not conservative values, but rather capitalist values that structure this type of unequal access to food, a system that pro produces authoritarian uh, social structures and violence. In the 1990s, Iraqi Kurdistan had been turned into a laboratory of humanitarian development policies. For Hushyar, the NGO comes here to distribute and create unequal access to resources. So let's see what exactly, uh, what kind of economy had been created. Michelle's experience um, is at the beginning of the international UN sanctions. The sanctions period started in 1991 until 2003. A scholar, uh, Joy Gordon, describes this period in her book as invisible war. She explains that at this time, Iraq as a country produced only one third of the consumed food. So Iraq was dependent. Sanctions meant that, I quote, with the narrow exceptions of medicine and conditionally food, Iraq could import nothing, could export nothing, could receive no funds. And every member state of the UN, virtually every country in the world was obliged to enforce these restrictions, unquote. Gordon also speaks over half a million children who died as a result of the sanctions. She explains that, Quote, Sanctions regime it imposed in conjunction with the massive bombing campaign of 1991 destroyed nearly all of Iraq's infrastructure, industrial capacity, agriculture, telecommunications and critical public services, particularly electricity and water treatment. Unquote. So in 1995 the oil for food program was introduced and it modified the rules of the sanctions a bit um, however, during this time, Iraqi lives were basically tied to the global oil market um, as oil was exported and in turn food imported and distributed to Iraqi citizens. Uh, local production was made impossible. Lissi Schmidt uh, captures the sentiment and humor of that time um, in the hook as people uh, understood perfectly well that their economic situation what their economic position was in imperialist economies. In 1993, a voice in Duhok um, says, many of our officials profit from this impervious chaos that has been created. They are not interested in resolving the crisis. Um, and exactly this was the case. During this crisis, all local agricultural production was targeted as local products would not be bought by the UN and distributed but rather um, the UN imported food items. So the people in Duhok in this time uh, reframe the situation through jokes and uh, they sum it up as uh, the UN's uh, winter assistance for Kurdistan and uh, trade assistance for Turkey. And materially this joke meant that, and I quote from uh, Schmidt, products are bought in Turkey worth 90 million dollars from the US money, money allocations to the UN, even for the specific agricultural assistance, which is led by the Allied forces, 9 million liters of diesel is bought in Turkey and 9,750 tons of wheat seeds." Unquote. So lastly, in Kurdistan, this invisible war of economic sanctions had turned into a war in everyday life about access to resources. I have looked at this through a people-centered approach where the textures of sanctions in people's everyday lives become clear. And this texture takes the meaning of war. Husher's example shows us um, how accessing resources peacefully was more made increasingly difficult with an imperial aggression such as the sanctions and a humanitarian aid regime that reproduced Saddam's hierarchies and used clan leaders in positions of power almost like the old times of British colonialism. Of course, we have to see the violence of Iraqi Kurdish party politicians and leaders, but we have to see them as an extension of the violence of the invisible war of sanctions. Thank you. So I think uh, what was really for me tempting in this um, video was that um, uh, two things. One is, of course, that you actually challenge the very understanding of 
a civil word that is really dominant in academia, but also in a popular understanding. And this, again, is why it's important to actually have a political economy lens when we talk on the region West Africa, West Asia and North Africa. And uh, the second uh, aspect, I think, is that uh, we can actually understand through these remarks how the foundation for today's um, dependence, economic dependence of Iraq was, uh, was laid. Of course, there are other aspects to it, but I think this is also really important. So if we look today in 2020 on Iraq, uh, be it central Iraq or be it Kurdistan Iraq, we have to take this into consideration. And um, again, this is another point I really want to underlay here. We actually see that there, uh, through political economy, it helps us to think um, certain expert aspects together. We don't have to divide to understand Kurdistan, Iraq and uh, Central Iraq because they have lived a certain economic uh, history. And um, now I would uh, want to um, opened the, uh, the, the very last video from Shedova, the third video. Okay, so now I would like to look into the post-US invasion economy in people's everyday life. So the post-2003 economy is an economy that is tied to the global capitalist market, um, market's need uh, through oil. This economy turns war into one of the most important ways to make a living. As I just explained in uh, the Iraqi Kurdish civil war between 1994 to 1997, this global economy had created a local elite um, that is allied with international capital um, and not interested in creating a system with equal state services to all citizens. Therefore, um, in, the, in this position, these kind of, uh, this kind of local elite, which uh, would be parties, clan leaders, um, other exiled Iraqi elites, um, they would channel resources to people according to political party affiliation in Kurdistan. And after 2003, they would do this in central Iraq. Um, and in central Iraq, it would be sectarianism that would be one of the ideologies of war. So what does this mean on the lab everyday level? How does war become one of the easiest options to make a living? I would like to give two accounts uh, from Baghdad um, of two men in their late 20s. So there's one uh, at one point, Haider, who explains that when the war against ISIS began, he joined the Hajj al-Shaabi, the popular mobilization forces. He's 25 years today and he is a volunteer with an NGO in Baghdad. When I asked him why he joined, he said he did not have a job, the family needed an income. And one of the only ways to earn some money was the militia. But also it seemed the right thing to do and protect his own land when ISIS attacked. He could not stay home and do nothing. So it was not exactly his support of the Hajj al-Shabi, um, but it was a good way for him to earn a living and fight ISIS. He earned uh, around $400 uh, a month uh, with them. However, once uh, the biggest war, a part of the war with ISIS was, o was over, he came back to Baghdad. He realized that he did not like the structures um, in the militia. Um, the other young man is Saeed, um, who was uh, in his late 20s, married with a child. And he explained that he also joined a militia um, but not, but did not engage so much in the work of the militia, um, but he was their driver. So he explained that there were little other opportunities for work. He had been offered this job and taken it, also out of curiosity. During his work with the militia for some months, he said he realized their behavior seemed immoral to him. He had seen how people's money would be taken, how they were blackmailed, robbed or kidnapped. Since he was not totally dependent on that salary, he was able to quit the job. Today, he found a job in a shop in Baghdad. So for Said, he could afford to have other moral values um, 
that lead him out of the militia. He was not dependent on the money. Both accounts um, show us how war becomes part of their everyday lives um, to make a living. It is an option um, to earn money. So war has um, very much become normalized. Um, of course, there's uh, the agency of people and uh, both men have left the militias again. And today the biggest proof maybe for this agency is the revolution. Um, people today are denouncing the decades of war and all those economic structures that allowed for this war in and on Iraq. Hereby, they demystify sectarianism and party politics as ideologies of war. With a persistent effort to stay peaceful, protesters are radically breaking with the past of the war and economic injustice. They take ownership over their country's own resources again, um, and thereby they are also taking ownership over their lives, refusing to sell themselves and their bodies to war. Thank you. So as there was a problem with the previous video, there's actually a point I think we have to um, rediscuss and so I would uh, like to ask you again to elaborate on how the humanitarian aid and the humanitarian aid regime basically that was implemented during the sanctions period in, uh, in Iraq, uh, so also in uh, Kurdistan, Iraq in the 90s how this actually affected uh, the economy in Iraqi Kurdistan and agriculture and generally what, um, what, were, the, um, what were the effects? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, thanks for this, uh, for this question and this point I think is, is really important, um, is an important point because um, we see the effects until now and it had been the, I mean, the sanctions period is usually overlooked, but when we look at the sanctions period, we actually have um, an economy that, a local Iraqi economy that is basically destroyed, um, where local production is destroyed. And if you look at it, um, I mean, there's an international sanctions regime which does not allow, allow Iraq to uh, decide on its own what is, uh, what is it going to import, export or anything. And then on top of that, you have an, in the, I mean, in that, at that time in the Kurdistan region mostly, a uh, re very severe humanitarian aid regime. And uh, this aid regime reproduces certain structures, um, also of Ba'athist uh, authoritarian structures. Um, also we have um, certain, um, we have, uh, as in the example that I showed you, um, um, from people who were saying that they see how the, these NGOs are coming in and how they are actually allocating resources to clan leaders. And so for the people on, in their everyday life, um, making a living means that they have to actually uh, reproduce these kind of structures and uh, to find resources and food for a living um, means that uh, the, the clan or the leader is the only one they can go to um, for, yeah, for actually making a living. So. Um, we see that it's uh, it's almost like a British colonialism. <laughs> I mean, you have uh, you have this kind of sanctions regime, and this is how it translates into into people's everyday life. And this is the the violence of, of the sanctions regime. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I, yeah. Really I think it's a really important point because it also shows us that uh, certain um, positions of certain uh, social structures, so be it clans, as in your examples, are not just given. And they are also not simply historically grown. They are also um, implemented uh, first by dictatorship and then again through international um, through an international aid regime in this context. And of course, this is not only unique to Iraq. We can also see this actually in the way it is dealt with humanitarian aid in Lebanon, and you can even see the same in uh, in Syria. So I think this is something really important also to take into consideration when we kind of discuss um, power relations in these uh, societies and often just choose to uh, look from above, uh, choose to use certain, um, certain terminology like civil war and so on without actually looking into the uh, details. So thank you very much for this uh, insight. 
and um, the videos for those that didn't have a good internet connection or for uh, for also for our own folds you can uh, you can watch them online uh, starting from next week we will have a platform where you can also uh, share these videos and this is actually the reason we decided not to have a event uh, in length but to give you the possibility to again and again um, watch them, share them, and actually delve into the discussion with others uh, also on these topics. So your remarks already uh, perfectly paved the way for the second part of the talk, which is the input from Iraq itself. The group Workers Against Sectarianism, which I advise you to follow on Facebook and Telegram, is one of the many self-organized groups having taken to the streets since October 2019. Thousands of mainly young people being fed up with the political and economic system have demonstrated on public streets, on public squares, parks, and ever since they actually have occupied them. In these protest camps that they have set up, they often develop their own modes of being and living together and probably making a living, um, just to use and rephrase what Shuba had said. Also, in times of Corona, the protests continue, but in order to protect themselves and others on a much lower scale. We will now show you three videos uh, from the group, which due to the imposition of a complete curfew could not take these um, videos uh, live on a protest square, but they had to make the videos in their home quarters. Um, yes, so uh, the first video is from Ziyad Tara. Um, and he will give us a basic idea of the group's work and of their own self-understanding. And again, please feel free to comment on the Facebook page, ask questions or write in, in an email. And um, I think it's actually really uh, amazing to have these insights from, uh, from Iraq. I'm, I'm really sad that they cannot join us live, but uh, Shiluva is very well connected to the group and she also witnessed the protests in Iraq firsthand. So please also feel free to, um, to go with your questions beyond uh, just the input she gave, but she also can give us really important insight on the protests now. اهلا اصدقاء احنا مركز اوركز سكتريان هازنت تاسس حديثا ب 2019 مجموعه نشطاء منذ 2010 منخرطين بالحراك الاحتجاجي في العراق احنا ضمان البطاله والحركه الاقتصاديه في البلد من الرغم أن البلاد العراقي يمر بأزمة اقتصادية موحشة وتسريح العاطلين تسريح يعني بأعداد هائلة حاليا العراق يشهد هاي الاحتجاجات بهاي السبب الظروف الاقتصادية والسياسية زين أحنا كفريق نحاول أن نوصل الحركة الاحتجاجية والحركة السياسي والسياسية إلى نشاط العالم وحول العالم ككل زين فريق نعمل على التواصل ونتأمل إنه نبني حلقات تواصل مع العالم الخارجي والنشاط حول العالم زين احنا من ضمن اهدافنا عندنا لقاءات مع الناشطين في الحراك والتجمع والتجمعات في ساحه التحرير وغيرها من المحافظات الجنوبيه وعندنا لقاءات مع ناس في المتقدمين في المجتمع وعندنا لقاءات مع ناشطات نسويات ايضا وعندنا عده اعمال ونتمنى هاي كلها انه نوصلها الى العالم الخارجي اللي شنو اللي يدور بالعراق من حركه سياسيه واقتصاديه زين ونكتبها بال... نكتب مقالات بال... بالصحف او 
على موقعنا ايضا نكتب هم مقالات بالانجليزيه ونترجمها بالانجليزيه نحاول نوصل صوتنا يعني للعالم وهذا الشيء يعني لازم نكون متعاونين ويا الكل So the second video we are going to watch now is a video by Sami Adnan on the group's understanding of the political economy of Iraq and I think it's actually quite good to listen to more local voices and also to recognize that people are uh, not only constantly making analysis themselves, they're making them in the protest camps, they're constantly discussing these. But I think we should also hear, so I'm now talking on the Global North, we should more and more recognize um, that there is actually this knowledge production from activists themselves, also when it comes to questions of political economy. So I'm very happy to share this with you. Marhaba. Sami Adnan from Workers Against Sectarianism. الاقتصاد العراقي بشكل عام اقتصاد متوحش وقاسي ومبني على الله وضعلا ما يقارب أكثر من يقارب إلى النصف عدد السكان هم يعيشون حالة بطالة حسب التقارير الدولية وآخرين هم هم العمال الكسبة أو ما نسميهم بالبركيريوس وركرز لا يوجد أي قانون يحميهم وهم غير محميين من قبل الدولة و هناك أيضا عمال آخرين هم عاملين في الدولة من غير إنتاج مجرد عدد فهؤلاء إحنا نسميهم بالبطالة المقنعة اللي أيضا هم عمال ولكن لا يقدمون أي إنتاج الشعب العراقي انتفض أكثر من مرة حول هاي السياسة سياسة الإفطار وطالب الشعب العراقي بدعم الاقتصاد المحلي وليس الوطني أو القومي ولكن المحلي كمزارعين وعمال وإعادة فتح المعامل والمصانع اللي تعود إنتاجها إلى الدولة لأن لازم تعرفون أمر في غاية الأهمية إحنا في العراق دولة ريعية دولة تعتمد دولة رئيس مالية ريعية تعتمد على بيع النفط صناعة بيع النفط وبالمقابل تعطي رواتب للموظفين اللي إحنا نسميهم البطالة المقنعة من دون أي دعم للدولة أو الاقتصاد هذا بالإضافة إلى السياسة النيوليبرالية الجديدة وسياسة الخصخصة اللي ترفع يد مسؤولية الدولة من تقديم الخدمات والرعاية الاجتماعية للمجتمع أيضا نقطة جدا مهمة أحب أن أشير لها إلى أنه الاقتصاد العراقي بالإضافة إلى أنه دولة ريعية لكنه بالفعل يعتمد 99% و90% على النفط على واردات النفط من أجل استيراد الضروريات الحياتية اللي اللي ديم عمل واستمرارية هذا النظام بالمقابل العراق لا يصنع أي شيء حتى قطاع الخاص بالعراق هو قطاع خاص معطل ولا ينتج أي شيء لذلك إحنا نشوف حتى الخضروات نستوردها من الخارج بالإضافة إلى جميع مستلزمات الصناعية المنزلية أدوات التنظيف حتى أقل أدوات وأصغر الأدوات هي تجي من إيران تجي من تركيا ومن السعودية ومن الصين فالعراق لا يصنع أي شيء هذا الاقتصاد المتوحش بظل وجود هاي البطالة المليونية اقتصاد متوحش قاسي لا يدعم الإنسان لا يدعم قدراته فمن جهة عندنا احنا بطالة وعندنا عمال كسبة ومن جهة أخرى تأتي الدولة بحلول اقتصادية لإنعاشها على كاهل العمال مثلا الخصخصة فواتير الكهرباء ما إلى آخره ضرائب خصوصا على العمال وأصحاب التاكسي إلى آخره إحنا الآن طبعا نعيش بأزمة اقتصادية حاليا انهيار أسعار النفط والدولة تبحث عن قروض باستمرار لحل ومعالجة العجز الموجود في الميزانية ميزانية الدولة من أجل دفع رواتب لمستحقيها ولكن 
بسبب هاي السياسة الريعية الدولة إلى إلى الآن لم تجد أي سبيل آخر أو أي حل آخر غير الاقتراض من المواطنين أنفسهم أو سلب ما تبقى من أموال لديهم وبالنهاية هاي القروض اللي راح تأخذها الدولة من راح يدفعها راح يدفعها بالنهاية الشعب العراقي الشعب العراقي هو اللي راح يدفع هاي القروض آه هو آه بين المستقبل بالمقابل دولة ما فكرت ابدا شلون تعيد دور راس المال بداخل آه بداخل دول بداخل الدولة العراقية آه ويسوي اعادة انتاج او فتح معامل او مزارع او دعم ال... So uh, now we will actually watch the third video and the third video is an insight on how self-organization works on the protest camp in Tahrir Square and what is actually the own political economy of this protest camp. مرحبا بالنسبة لموضوع كيف يمارس المتظاهرين أو كيف يقضي المتظاهرين المتظاهرين حياتهم في ساحة التحرير بالبداية لما صار الاعتصام كثير من المعتصمين كثير من الأصدقاء تبرعوا للمتظاهرين والمتظاهرين من مصاريفهم الخاصة من جيوبهم الخاصة اشتروا خيم ومن خلال هاي الخيم كانت في البداية الجو حار وبعدين بدأ الموسم الشتوي يبدي وبعدين المتظاهرين بدأوا يشترون بعض المقاعد الخشبية من أجل تحميهم من المطر وكانت المنطقة الموجودة فيها الاعتصام هي منطقة بشكل عام تجارية فمن خلال المحلات وتبرعات من المحلات المتظاهرين قدروا يستخدمون الخيم وقدروا يستخدمون المنامات او الاغطيه وكذلك بعض المتظاهرين قاموا بشراء بعمل مطبخ في ساحه التحرير خيمه خاصه بالمطبخ خيمه خاصه في مخزن للمواد الغذائيه بالمطبخ نجد انه هناك أوعية للطبخ أو احنا نسميه بالعراق الجدر للطبخ ومخزن خاص لتخزين المواد الغذائية وكان كفد يعني مناظر جدا جميلة مثلا الرجل والمرأة يطبخون سويا وليس فقط الأمر مقتصر على النساء أيضا المتظاهرين قاموا بعمل حمامات باترومز وايضا حمامات من اجل الاغتسال ايضا المتظاهرين كانوا يعني قد حضروا مسبقا من بدايه الثوره او الانتفاضه غسالات لغسل الملابس وكانوا كان كان ايضا هذا منظر ملفت انه رجل يغسل الملابس وايضا امراه تغسل الملابس في نفس الـ 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 الوقت. من ايضا المتظاهرين كانوا يسوون الكثير من الاجتماعات ويقضون وقتهم ب بندوات وسيمينارات من اجل تباحث بقضايا السياسيه بقضايا الجندريه بقضايا المساواه بقضايا الاجتماعات خاصة بخصوص الانتفاضه بخصوص التنظيم من اجل الانتفاضه وتوحيد الصكوك وبرؤيه واضحه وطبعا هذا الصراع يعني ما كان شيء سهل يعني بالنسبه للمتظاهرين خصوصا انه كانت الاجواء دائما محتدمه كان دائما يعني لما نروح ساحه التحرير اكو رصاص واكو قنابل مسيله للدموع آه هذا الشيء كانت الدولة تسويه أو الحكومة تسويه من أجل أن تشغل المتظاهرين حتى ما ينظمون نفسهم أكثر حتى ما ي... آه يفكرون شلون يواجهوها تشغلهم بهاي الأمور 
فبس كان اكو دائما اجتماعات مستمره بين الخيم بين اعضاء الخيم اللي تساعد التعرير وكانوا كانت اعداد الخيم طبعا كبيره جدا ما يقارب ال اكثر من الف خيمه من عده ناس ايضا ننسى دور التوك توك اللي كان ينقل مجانا ما ننسى ان المتظاهرين جابوا كهرباء من التيلات الكهرباء ولدوا للخيم ايضا جابوا انترنت وسووا انترنت على مود يغطون الساحه باول باول ايضا ما ننسى دور التوك توك اللي كان ينقل المسافين وينقل الناس مجانا وينقل الجرحى مجانا ايضا كانت اكو كثير من حفلات التعارف بين المتظاهرين وكان ايضا يسوون ندوات ثقافيه في في الساحه يتجمع الالاف حول 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 الناشطين ويتحدثون بالقضايا السياسيه والثقافيه ايضا سووا مكاتب من اجل قضاء الوقت بالقراءه خصوصا بالليل يعني ياخذون الوقت بالقراءه والدراسه ايضا بعض المعلمين سووا دورات للتقويه لتدريس الطلاب كثير يعني حقيقه من الاشياء ما ننسى دور الاطباء والمسعفين والمسعفات اللي كانوا بالخط الامامي النساء المتظاهرات اللي كانوا في الخط الامامي كمتظاهرات كنساء كرجال كشباب كاطفال كثير حقيقه من الامور الرائعه هي شيء كان ياخذ المتظاهرين وقتهم وهي كانت حياتهم So if you like these videos and you want to have a deeper insight on voices from the ground, uh, not only these guys, also of course they're, as they also said, they're connected to the uh, actually now developing feminist movement in Iraq. Just follow them on Facebook or on the Telegram channel to also have actually daily updates and realize it's not just a one-time event. Actually, people are constantly struggling in Iraq right now. So um, I see we uh, already have the first discussions going uh, on and uh, this is really amazing. And I would like to ask you uh, one of the questions posed by our followers by uh, Samia Herschenhain and uh, she's asking a question concerning um, the Kurds and their reaction to ISIS and I will a little reframe it so um, I hope I understood you also correctly, Samia. Um, so why there was rather a military response than a political action by the Kurds fighting ISIS? And um, uh, maybe here you could first elaborate what was actually the response, because I think also um, we have all a different level of knowledge, so it would be good if you just really quickly can give us an idea of this and what is actually the political context in which ISIS was emerging. emerging. So often it's uh, only framed as this quite savage violence or Islamism and often uh, it's overlooked that there was um, underlying political conditions that created the political economy that fostered uh, the emergence of uh, ISIS. Um, yeah, so, I mean, let's say um, at the moment when, when ISIS was actually uh, on the stage uh, and uh, we, had, uh, we had ISIS um, in uh, Iraq uh, emerging and taking over, it was taking over Mosul, I think, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, we, in that situation, I mean, uh, the only response to give uh, was a military response um, because we were already at that stage so this was the the response given and um i mean understanding how iraq's military also works is also to understand how the iraqi state and how the iraqi kurdish state works because you don't have like a one military force of the iraqi state you have uh, i mean from the kurdish side from the kurdish regional government you have the peshmerga forces then you have uh, different militias um uh, in central Iraq, um, most popular was the Hashd al-Shabi, uh, the popular mobilization forces, and you had the, um, the state's uh, forces. And, uh, and this was kind of then the, um, yeah, the military response that, that, we, that uh, could emerge and uh, fight ISIS. But um, if we try to understand how could ISIS 
I mean, come to the stage and uh, how could the state respond, how could the, the different forces inside Iraq respond to ISIS. It was also about uh, the dismantling of the state. I mean, the state had been dismantled decades and decades earlier um, by, I mean, it was not only the US invasion, this was an important factor to really uh, crush all sorts of uh, whatever you had as an Iraqi state that was also basic civil services to people. This was also, I mean, it was also the sanctions before that that already um, uh, crumbled basically the what what kind of uh, the kind of state that you had and um, and basically what I said in uh, in the videos before you had already uh, this kind of sectarianization uh, that mm -hmm. was happening because people were forced to do that in order to uh, gain resources and to. Um, I mean, uh, ethnicity and uh, sectarian affiliation became very important uh, during those times to uh, survive. So this was the violence that was taking place. And um, yeah, and I mean, just before, this is maybe also important to know, just before ISIS uh, came to the stage, there were also huge and massive protests, uh, mm -hmm. also in Mosul, also in Baghdad, uh, also in Kurdistan, uh, about, um, about the malfunctioning of the state, um, uh, no uh, services, no electricity, no water, basically what is happening and going on for a long time. And uh, so ISIS um, was then able to also take on these grievances because um, mm -hmm. you just had a very authoritarian uh, leader, it was Maliki at that time, who uh, crushed uh, all these protests very violently. And uh, so this was also is important to, to remember um, this kind of economic aspects and also how, as I said, uh, international capital um, had created this kind of state and this kind of elites mm -hmm. that had an interest that this uh, war could emerge. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. maybe that... Uh, yeah, I think uh, the very last point again is um, actually really linking to the discussion uh, Jamie had opened up uh, with this discussion on uh, war economy in Syria where he basically, one level of analysis was to say that the different international actors being involved in the war in Syria, also their economy is linked to this, um, to this war. So war economy is not only something actually uh, locally in this sense, so although he was dismantling this very understanding of the term, but nevertheless, but it's connected to these states being involved, their, uh, their economy. And again, we see it here, uh, and it comes uh, to, when it comes to uh, to Iraq. Uh, that's uh, actually very interesting and links us already to uh, to the next point because um, as you were mentioning, there are these um, there are these economic interests. You had mentioned that uh, during the sanctions period, Turkey uh, was uh, having uh, actually trade interest in the continuation of the sanctions regime then uh, this of course is continuing uh, today in Iraq many of the food imports are from Turkey as you said the agriculture was uh, crumbled and um, we have the same with uh, with Iran being heavily involved in uh, an economy in the Iraqi uh, economy um, having continuous interest to uh, sustain this relation. Right now we see it um, that Iran is actually pushing forward to reopening the borders to Iraq because there is um, religious tourism, which is uh, also um, economic, uh, important uh, economic uh, branch. So um, you have all of this um, involvement and uh, I saw it in, um, in Iraq at the protests that uh, people pick this up. So uh, for me, it would be really interesting to ask you um, about uh, the um, yeah about the understanding of political economy reflected by the protesters' slogans. So um, I think right now you see some uh, pictures from the uh, or you will now see some pictures uh, from the uh, from the protests. Um, so uh, you can see on these slogans that people uh, hold up signs with quite um, straightforward political uh, analysis. So one uh, reads, yes to national uh, liberation to all forms of uh, hegemony, 
no debt accumulation, no to loans, no to the confiscation of the future of Iraq. Um, another one of these signs basically reads um, that uh, no to any kind of uh, occupation. Then you see a, a graffiti where, uh, where it uh, reads, um, I, uh, I want my oil. So also people claiming the, uh, the natural resources um, or the revenues from these natural resources for their own. And um, the other picture um, is a picture, uh, a quite colored, uh, uh, one um, which is an expression of a campaign going on uh, since months in Iraq where people try to raise awareness for consumption of local produced, locally produced um, Iraqi uh, products. So could you uh, evolve a little bit more on the uh, political economy of these slogans, what they mean? Uh, what does it mean to have a homeland? How is this connected to these economic uh, demands? Um, yeah, I think this is actually really uh, re like the really interesting part because it's happening now and it's, uh, it's a really important moment for all Iraqis and all those who seek, uh, who seek justice um, to, to, demand this, to demand this and to see how uh, present also the economy is in people's thinking and in their everyday like these kind of practices of struggling um, and asking and demanding um, for example their homeland i mean we could understand homeland as some sort of national sentiment to create some um yeah to create a, your national country but i would rather um, look at it from a different perspective and uh, see how people actually um, demand a homeland that uh, as something that uh, belongs to them as something where they have uh, um, as something that involves the oil of Iraq as a natural resource as something that um, involves Iraq's agriculture as something that belongs to people that is their um, natural resource so it's something that people um, are really asking now um, to um, yeah, have ownership over these resources, mm. um, to uh, have, um, have a say in what, what is happening um, about on these resources. Because um, I hope it became clear now that, um, I mean, through these decades, what has happened uh, in Iraq, all this privatization after the US occupation, but also during Saddam Hussein's regime, um, basically stole from the people of Iraq. I mean, it was a theft. Uh, so so pe the people themselves, they didn't have any ownership mm. over their resources, over their homeland, over uh, their lives um, and how to build their lives. So mm. when, uh, when they now um, actually demand, um, yeah, demand uh, a homeland or demand that their local products uh, be sold and have a national liberation, then it's also about um, rejecting basically the sellout of their country, rejecting that you have all these massive foreign uh, imports uh, to their country, which make any kind of local um, economy um, where people can uh, yeah, res be responsible to make their own living um, mm -hmm. for themselves. Uh, it makes it impossible, I mean, these, uh, these uh, imports. So that's why um, it's so important that people are raising these demands and uh, that it's so central also for, for themselves um, because it's, it's a direct answer to all those decades of war and violence that has been happening. Uh, hmm. And um, so yeah, I think it's, it's very beautiful to see that, that people are actually yeah, standing up and, and demanding that. Um, hmm. And yeah. uh, could you probably say uh, one, two sentences about um, how the uh, how the we don't actually know, but how the political elite or the counter revolutionary forces are actually reacting, especially to these uh, economic uh, demands. Like I think I saw how they were looting of, of local production or so. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Because it shows us that these economic demands are not. It's it's not something simple. Like people give their lives for it. It seems. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. Uh, I agree, and uh, you have um, you have basically uh, also the national Iraqi elite 
that is allied with an international elite that is allied with uh, I mean different different uh, multinational companies be it oil companies as well um, be it uh, um, I mean US uh, interests uh, Iranian interests uh, that you that you have um, that um, are very violently crushing any of those demands I mean uh, we have almost over 600 uh, dead now in the in the revolution so I mean the economy is at the heart of uh, of people's demands and um, um, yeah so um, and this this elite and their international allies they are not interested in in, um, in any kind of local production or local economy mm -hmm. I mean I think one example um, that you might refer to was uh, for example we have in agriculture uh, every year uh, in the harvest season you have a looting of all those uh, agricultural fields mm -hmm. and uh, it's of course it's, it's difficult to find out exactly who it is but uh, I mean some activists are saying that these might be uh, Iranian spies uh, not interested in that Turkish ones because you have of course mm -hmm. lots of these food uh, imports come from uh, Iran and Turkey um, and so they have a direct interest that there is no Iraqi local agricultural production even though Iraq has a very strong agricultural history and mm -hmm. um, yeah might be able to be self-sufficient in certain ways if mm -hmm. it's uh, allowed so mm. I think there is a comment uh, on on Facebook from Ahmed uh, Lue that actually links to it so he's basically stating there is no word called economy in Iraq and Kurdistan the oil money goes to personal accounts and I think this is also what you say, this is also what the protests, um, the protesters uh, already um, uh, since over five years when they came up with the slogan in the name of religion, you robbed us, yeah. they were actually uh, especially pointing, uh, pointing to this reality. So thank you for this comment, Ahmed. Yeah, maybe, I mean, one thing, uh, I know that here in this sense, uh, Ahmed might call it, uh, there's no wo word called economy in this kind of capitalist economy sense, but I mean, in people's everyday lives, of course, they are, everybody is waking up every day, um, getting groceries, getting whatever they need to live, and this is also a people's mm -hmm. economy, and, uh, and um, people just want a more just economy, so, so of course, there's this kind of, um, mm -hmm. I mean, we have to just make a difference between yeah. what kinds of economies we're talking about. Um, actually, there is a video uh, from uh, Tahrir Square where we can see this. So we see that in the moment of revolution, like we have it right now, uh, it's, there is not only a theoretical discussion, they actually start to practice this. So having their own understanding of economy, um, having their own understanding of making a living, and uh, we would like to show you one of the videos that the group Workers Against Sectarianism took on Tahrir Square uh, some days ago, where uh, they interview a protester that uh, basically states this. طبعا صديقاتي واصدقائي وانا اتجول في في حديقة الأم حيث المعتصمين يعني الشاب الراقي هو واحد من مجموعة شباب يقدمون خدمة للمعتصمين مساء الخير لا مرحبا الخاص شو اسمك انت؟ والله اسمي مشتاق يا حبيبي ايش قصة لكم؟ والله من واحد عشرة يا حبيبي وردة انت الله يخليك شنو شغلك هناك؟ ايش تسوون يعني؟ والله نسوي شاي سياح شلغم يا حبيبي شي جينا نسوي ورد انت تمارس دورين ايه هم متظاهر وهم اوزع العالم اوكي ومعتصم في نفس الوقت ان شاء الله شو شو تعمل؟ شو تريد؟ ها؟ شو تريد؟ والله اريد حقوق هاي العالم خطيل، عالم القاعده بطاله، اي الشباب خطيل تكتل استشهد ادري انتم مو جيتوا طلعتوا على عادل عبد المهدي، عبد المهدي راح انا ما طالع على عادل عبد المهدي لا عليه ما طالع انا طالع على الحزاب حلو اي على الحزاب، عادل عبد المهدي ما له رجال ما له شغل شو تريدون يعني من الاحزاب؟ يعوفون اللي يطلعون من العراق بعد، يعوفون العراق بحاله، عالم تمهدلت عالم شباب راحت ضحت اها اي اذا الشغل مو يم الحكومه الشغل يم الاحزاب الطموح بعراق انه مو لهم اي صحيح 
للاحزاب مو للعراق زين يعني اريد اسالك سؤال اخر اي جواب زين طلع تغيروا واجوا غيرهم نفس, نفس الشيء شو تسوي؟ نفس الشيء ما سوى شيء اي ما سوى شيء يعني اذا مو زين هم تطلع؟ اي ما سوى شيء لا اذا مو زينين هم نطلع اي ظل منا انا ما سقطهم حبيبي تحياتي لك خالد الله يسلمك شكرا لك So um, we also have a question from Ali Yas, and he is asking how do the people in Kurdistan, Iraq, look at the federal government within the frame of the October Revolution, and how would you describe the relationship with uh, Baghdad? So I think he means it on a political uh, level, but I would like to add, uh, if you will know, Hadi, I would like to add also the other level. So um, people's solidarities, because we should, when we look um, at these countries, uh, we should not only always look on political regimes, but also on relations uh, between, between activists, for example, between movements. Um, so maybe you could also uh, tell us a little about this. So what other protests we s could see in uh, in Kurdistan, for example? Yeah. So it's a threefold question. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I hope uh, I will make a try. I mean, um, let's say. I mean, there's uh, so there are, as you say, there are like two levels um, of relations. So you have on the one hand this relation between Baghdad and Erbil, that is the official uh, government uh, level. Um, Uh, relation that is basically, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, you just hear about it as a dispute. There is always the dispute between Baghdad and uh, Abil, um, mostly on the budget. Um, I mean, there is like um, this allocation of 17% of the Iraqi national budget will go to Abil. And uh, usually um, the, uh, the issues that come up are that uh, both sides are just so corrupt <laughs> that uh, there is a constant dispute going on. Which um, for the for the people it translates into a situation of um, of anger and frustrations because they are not able to receive their salaries, um, and you have to understand that for the people in the Kurdistan region, but also for the people in Central Iraq, um, these salaries um, are basically tied tied to this uh, to the global oil market and this uh, oil income, and so. If we look at it from now a uh, perspective of the people and what kind of um, situation we have there, we had, for example, recently also protests in Kirkuk um, mm -hmm. where people uh, had demanded that uh, they, they just get their salaries directly from Baghdad and not from Erbil. So the, what I want to say is that uh, people's perception um, is changing slowly um, into a perception of economy. I mean, they are like, okay, What does it? Uh, how does it benefit me if I have um, a Kurdish regional government or an Iraqi government, but I don't have my salary? So they are more and more thinking in terms of economic perspectives rather than, um, let's say, a national or ethnic or sectarian perspective. And then um, I think an important um, thing is as well that. Um, For people in the Kurdistan region, I mean, they are looking at the protests in Baghdad and uh, I mean, it's difficult to say how the general view is. Of course, it, it depends very much, but um, you, have an, you have a situation where people are also more preoccupied with their own situation. And uh, there it had led to protests. I mean, recently also in Kurdistan, you had protests um, because of the injustices. So I would say that uh, it's very localized and people mm -hmm. everywhere are seeing this and um, I mean what we have also seen uh, were certain delegations um, from activists in Kurdistan to Baghdad's Tahrir Square so I think there is an exchange although um, this is not representative for the Kurdistan region I mean there are exchanges uh, amongst uh, activist groups uh, um, so that's how I would, uh, how would, I would frame it uh, mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. So uh, there is a comment from uh, Anna Kukuru and she's asking whether uh, we could make a book list um, and suggest books on Iraq and Kurdistan, I assume like connected to the topic. And of course, um, once the videos go online, they will go online with links to relevant articles, uh, to all the literature that um, Shluva has mentioned in her videos or 
workers against sectarianism have uh, mentioned. So this is uh, also the idea of the uh, mutual learning process that we actually have the possibility to go beyond this talk and treat up on these um, topics. And um, then there is another question. Um, let me read it. Uh, also from Anna asking, uh, what do you think about the problem of political and social situation to manage and control the illegal immigrants, especially during the protest period? Um, I'm not sure whether, so I just read it. I'm not sure whether I understand the question um, concerning the illegal immigrants. So I'm sorry, Anna, maybe you can specify it live. <laughs> and I uh, just write under your comment. Uh, meanwhile, I will ask uh, Shluva um, uh, another question, uh, which is concerning the current situation. So we know that worldwide the um, economic situation during the um, different uh, um, different political uh, measurements governments have taken during times of Corona. It's discussed how this. Um, economically uh, affects uh, people. And uh, in, in Iraq, uh, we already have um, the problem, and you have mentioned it, that actually the economic situation of people has deteriorated. And uh, also uh, certain uh, solidarity networks of um, within families uh, have broken up uh, during the sanctions and uh, further after. So, um, can you uh, explain us a little like how maybe first you can explain to us what are the measurements uh, concerning Corona taken in Kurdistan, Iraq? Like what's the um, what's the uh, what's the approach of the um, autonomous um, government there? And what's the uh, what's the approach of the central uh, central government? And how does it affect people? But also how do they uh, fight it or cope with it? Um, yes, sure. Um, so I think the, the measurements um, on uh, the coronavirus had been um, had been quite strict from uh, both, I mean, the autonomous regional government and the central government to uh, impose a lockdown. And um, there are phases where the lockdown is um, stronger or less stronger, where people are able to actually circulate and move around. I think now for the Eid period, it was there was again a lockdown imposed. Um, so it's quite the it's quite the same for um, for all of uh, Iraq, uh, mm -hmm. including Kurdistan. And um, what um, how people I mean react to this uh, is on the one hand, of course, there's a lack in uh, trust uh, in the health uh, system. So um, people understand these measures, and uh, they also I mean they also stay home because they know that once uh, they have corona, chances are not very good for um, mm -hmm. an adequate uh, resolution of this. So. Um, and at the same time, I think very important, we also saw the videos from our activists. Um, it was mainly the activists on uh, Tahrir Square and other activists that engaged in also awareness comp uh, raising campaigns of um, um, raising awareness about coronavirus, how mm -hmm. to uh, protect yourself and um, um, also deciding that uh, it is not safe to continue in full scale with the protest so they retreated uh, partly um, now they have decided that okay we can go back again um, to protest so um, this is on the one hand and then economically um, since not much had, had changed and it even got worse um, because uh, salaries are not always paid um, People have continued, of course, their protests in Tahrir Square, but also in uh, we have seen protests in Dahok now, um, in the north of uh, Iraq and Kurdistan, and Sudanmania and other areas. Um, and it is not only state employees; it is also um, informal workers. Um, many of those working in agriculture uh, are doing informal labor, so uh, they might try to sell their vegetables and whatever they have informally on roadsides. And these things are not possible, of course, if um, if movement is not allowed, if uh, if they cannot, um, yeah, if they cannot sell them. So, so they are also the most vulnerable. Um, 
on this manual. I'm not sure if I uh, mm -hmm. forgot <laughs> anything uh, mm -hmm. to answer anything, but I think um, yeah, this is on Corona mm -hmm. virus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there is um, a very last qu question I would uh, take. It's uh, from Ahmed uh, Luay, and I would uh, kind of reframe it. Uh, because what is important for us is to understand um, the questions we are discussing from a political economy perspective. Uh, so uh, when we um, look at the different political actors in, uh, in, um, and forms of um, uh, not only political parties but also political groups, uh, with um, uh, reference maybe to economic uh, policies, uh, could you uh, elaborate a little uh, on, on on this? I mean, um, one of the uh, questions he's raised is what, what do you think of these parties? But I don't think that this is what we want to discuss because there's a certain aspect for us. This is um, important. Uh, so to look at uh, the questions um, in discussion uh, from this political economy perspective. So maybe we can also do that. Is there um, something we can discuss when it comes to certain economic uh, policies of these parties? Um, I mean, if we, I mean, he I probably is talking about the Kurdistan region more than the rest mm -hmm. of Iraq. Um, and I think maybe here we can um, also reframe it a bit then that um, we usually think also of the separate entities of Kurdistan region and central Iraq. But actually, if you look into it deeper, then you have what you have in the Kurdistan region of these different political parties, uh, you also have in the central Iraq, and you have these political parties specifically um, trying to manage and uh, have access to as much resources as they can from the state mm -hmm. uh, through their own private companies. I mean, they it's not about only having a party. These parties are connected to private oil companies, to other global actors, have their own uh, connections to certain states, uh, to certain, um, yeah, let's say, let's call them multinational companies. Um, and, uh, and this is kind of then how these parties stand in relation to each other, talking from an economic perspective, because it's basically a race of who's getting more resources and then who can um, basically uh, gain um, loyalty, um, mm -hmm from people to their political party. So that's kind of the rationality of the political parties in their relation with each other. Of course, in if you look at it in everyday life, the political parties will be like, we stand for these and that values, but uh, economically, if we look at it, it's, um, yeah, it's much more about securing access to resources and then redistributing them in very unequal ways. Mm -hmm. not allowing for all citizens to actually have equal res equal access to the state's resources mm -hmm. they always have to go through these parties and that's yeah. the parties relation to each other yeah yeah so it's a uh, kind of uh, what is often uh, called uh, crony uh, capitalism and um, yeah. I think that's a, a really really important um, statement uh, to um, to uh, to end uh, the discussion, to uh, to take with us that there are certain aspects on an analytical level where it makes complete sense to think uh, Kurdistan, Iraq, and Central Iraq uh, together. And you just mentioned the um, the aspect of political parties where we often tend to probably understand them rather in ideological uh, terms. But if we break it down, we actually see if we have this kind of economy um, like we have it in Iraq, it's less a discussion on ideological uh, differences. And this is also how politics appears to the people. And um, this is why uh, we can see in, um, in Iraq's uh, protest squares that people completely refuse political parties. And um, we can also see similar dynamics uh, in Kurdistan, uh, Iraq, that people really have a, uh, a really difficult uh, relation uh, to parties after all these years where they have to fight uh, just to make a living. So uh, we come to, um, 
to uh, to the end um, of uh, of tonight's uh, discussion. So just allow me to say thank you to all persons who made this event possible. So let us start with tonight's uh, speakers. Uh, Shilva, uh, Ziyad, uh, Tari and Sami Adnan from Workers Against Sectarianism. Thank you very much also for your video inputs. And again, please uh, share them, watch them and um, engage in discussion uh, over them with others. Uh, also, thank you for Georg, who you all don't see, but I'm happy that he supported us today, um, not only with conceptualizing the event, but also with all the technical support. Then also on uh, this side, uh, you also don't see her, there is uh, Eva. Also, thank you, thank you for supporting us um, with the social media. And uh, last but not least, I want to thank um, our, um, our colleagues from Ashag Reisen who, um, who uh, gave us uh, this venue to do the um, event um, in and hosted um, the event, gave us the technical equipment to make this possible. And again, of course, thank you for the Heinrich Böll Foundation that uh, they supported us in trying a completely new approach. I hope you all uh, enjoyed it. And um, uh, yeah, again, next week, these videos will be online. Uh, follow us on, uh, on Twitter, on Facebook. And um, if you felt this is also an approach you like, well, you like to delve to into more, then just get in uh, get in touch with us. Um, if you want to write and you rather don't feel like sitting in front of the camera, also uh, get in touch with us. And um, any one of you that has critical ideas that wants to change also the discourse on. North Africa and West Asia, please just get in touch um, with us. And uh, the next event on war economies in this uh, series will uh, be announced soon and will likely uh, take place in June and on Syria. So thank you all for engaging in the discussion and for joining us. <laughs>